It probably helped find muted myself. <laughs> Or it'd probably help if uh, Andy probably muted me. Uh oh, she said Randall. I'm in trouble. Anyway, uh, can you? Is everything working on your end? Are you talking? To, yep. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. Good. okay me, good. Yeah. Yay! Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No too. <laughs> okay. Cool. Um, so we've got everything set up. So first question is: Where are you located in the big wide world? Um, at the moment, so I'm, my company is located in the United Kingdom, but I'm located in South of France. So I'm sitting in a town called Grasse, which is about uh, half an hour from Nice in South of France. Uh, it's famous for making perfume. There we go. Awesome. Excellent. And I'm, sitting, I'm actually in an old perfume factory today. Uh, there we go. So <laughs> our office is in a converted perfume factory. There you go. Small, small fact. Cool. Okie dokie. So it looks like it is time to start. So ladies and gentlemen, the last speaker, Mark Varley, um, and he's going to be aggregating global insurance risk in real time using Elasticsearch and H3. And Mark is the founder and CEO of Address Cloud, a uh, leading provider of software services, the insurance uh, lending and logistics industries. And uh, he's an OSGO charter member and has spoken at both UK international Phosphor G conferences and a strong advocate of serverless geospatial architecture. And with that, Mr. Mark, take it away. Oh, thank you, Randall. And I'm really pleased to be there or virtually. Uh, it will be, uh, I've been, I've attended pretty much every Phosphor G since 2013, um, which was my first Phosphor G. That's where I really got the idea to start my business um and found it very inspiring and then i met my co-founder thomas at 2015 in seoul in a drone workshop so yeah big fan of phosphor g and really really missing uh, hanging out in person but fingers crossed for next year and you know thanks to the t argentina team for doing such a fantastic job with the logistics of of getting this off the ground so uh without further ado i am going to launch into my presentation and hopefully you can see it once it comes through uh, there we go. Okay, so I'm hoping that you, I can't see any comments, so I'm hoping that you can see this okay. Um, so yeah, this talk is called Aggregating Global Insurance Risk. So uh, if you might have been under the illusion that, uh, like I was probably 10 years ago, that insurance is pretty boring, uh, it's actually super interesting. Uh, it's one of, I think it's one of the most interesting spaces, uh, uh, spaces for a spatial uh, geospatial uh, specialist or, or geographer to work in huge amounts of exciting stuff going on lots of exciting tech lots of big problems to solve um so that's what we did i, I started the business in 2015 um we are a uk based company i i'm actually based in france uh, the rest of the team are in the uk uh, i'm the founder and ceo um and uh over in the uk we're a small business we uh we're six employees at the moment uh we are growing and we are hiring. So, uh, and we are a remote company. So, if you're interested, little plug, maybe drop me a, a line at the end. But we provide a location intelligence service aimed uh, mostly at the insurance industry. Um, we do work with some other industries as well. We work with uh, lenders and also with some logistics companies. But insurance is my background and that's our bread and butter. And, and it represents around 90% of our business. Um, so these are all kind of geographic things that would uh, some geographic, some uh, socio demographic, but these are all kind of areas and, and, and things that insurers are worried about. And you can see straight away some of the uh, uh, applications of our geospatial uh, expertise to, to try and solve some of these problems. Um, so what we do is we provide a series of services. We have a uh, geocoding service. That's where we started out life. Uh, it's specifically focused at the UK and Ireland currently, uh, and it uses data from national mapping agencies as well as uh, postal services. Um, and we provide that a, a very unique stack that builds that as a service that we sell as a premium service to our customers. So it's great doing lots of cool stuff with geography, but if your location's in the wrong place, then uh, it's it, it, it kind of defeats the object. So making sure the location's at the right place is very important. Uh, we then provide an intelligence service that basically tells an insurer everything they need to know about a property. So what's it made of? Uh, how big is it? How many bedrooms does it have? And also its geographic risk. Is it likely to flood? Is it likely to fall in the ground? 
you know, what are the things that a, an insurer would care about? And then the final part of the journey, which I'm going to cover in this presentation, is around once an insurer has actually gone on cover and has actually said yes to the insurance, managing their portfolio and their exposure, how do they avoid having too much in one space? Um, we're going to go through that in the presentation and also uh, it's, it's not going to be that much technology in there, but I'm going to be making some references to Elasticsearch and some of the, our other parts of our stack uh, and, and Uber and the H3 library coming a little bit later. So uh, our stack serves of 10 million locations a month. Uh, a very high level, this is what it looks like. So, yeah, we're big uh, believers in, in uh, having a, a, the right tool for the right job. Our stack is, uh, as of last year, 100% serverless. And uh, a little plug for my colleague, Thomas Holderness. Uh, he did a talk yesterday on serverless geospatial. Actually, no, it was on Wednesday on serverless geospatial and our findings with uh, having run this in production for 18 months. Uh, and I, I recommend you uh, check out his talk if you are interested. But effectively, what we're providing is uh, a suite of services, each backed with what we think is the most appropriate data store or backend technology for the task. So for the geocoding, we're using Elasticsearch. That's where we started out. This was the first part of our stack. On our intelligence API, we do a mix of PostGIS, DynamoDB, and S3 using cloud-optimized geotiffs for our rasters. And then over here on the exposure, this is a new service for us, and we're working on this at the moment. And we think Elasticsearch is a great fit for this particular use case. So what's Elasticsearch? Well, it is, uh, this is the definition from the Elasticsearch's uh, website. Now, I'm not going to enter into the debate about is it open, is it not open? There's been a huge amount of, uh, if anyone follows this debate, there's been a big, uh, a lot of information about this in the news, in the, in the tech news in the last 18 months, mainly due to AWS uh, forking Elasticsearch and, 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 and making money off of it. Uh, I won't go into it, but it is a fantastic piece of technology and remains, if you use it on your desktop, you can go and pull it down, use it, build it, look at the code, uh, and it's a, it's a fantastic piece of software. Uh, it's, you know, Elasticsearch and our big company. When we started using them in 2015, it was a small sort of library just starting off as a company, but they've gone from strength to strength. We're huge fans of theirs. We think that what they do is amazing. Um, and again, really today, if anything, if there's one takeaway today is, and the next time you're looking at a problem and you're looking at the tools in your arsenal, think about Elasticsearch as, as an opportunity, uh, as a tool that you might not naturally think about uh, for solving geospatial problems. It's it's actually really good. Um, and particularly, I guess, so you, you, I, I, before I've, I've, I've gone to some of these things and I have talked about Elasticsearch at length before I've done workshops in Bonn. Um, I did a, if, if anyone, and again, another plug for the Mapscaping podcast, if you ha don't already listen to the Mapscaping podcast, I seriously recommend you download it and, and subscribe. It's a fantastic asset uh, that Daniel's done a great job in putting together. Um, I was lucky enough to be invited on twice, and I did a talk in February 2020 about Elasticsearch. Uh, and there's some great talks on there. Paul Ramsey's been on there a couple of times, and, and I, I, again, I li uh, well worth listening to his talks. They're excellent. But really, for me, Elasticsearch comes into its own when your use case is primarily around search. So if you're doing search with some geo, I think it's a great choice. I think if you're doing geo and you need to do a bit of full text search, then probably PostGIS or something else might be a better option. But really, if we take something like geocoding, geocoding, despite the name, doesn't have a lot of geo in it. It's mainly about search. Um, and that's why you know, that's what prompted us to look at this library in the first place. So here's just a quick uh, demo on the screen. This is our maps tool and you can see this, our geocoder. So we're doing a really simple look up there. Um, we're doing a postcode filter for the UK and then we enter in a building number. Um, we're using Elasticsearch for this and this is uh, a service that we provide into a lot of the insurers in the UK. Um, so if you're based in the UK, uh, when you go online to get your insurance, if you're going to morethan.com or um, Nationwide or Tesco's or some of these uh, well-known brands, when you call this service, you're calling us. Uh, and what we're doing is we're taking your request, we're running it through our AWS Lambda stack, hitting Elastic Searching and coming back with the results. You click on the location and your insurer knows where you are and everything about your property. And they will use that to decide whether or not they want to write your business, and if so, how much they want to charge for it. 
Um, we don't do the last bit, but we provide the information to help make that decision. Um, so that's a great use case for Elasticsearch. Again, there's a little bit of code here. I'm not going to go too much into Elasticsearch, but effectively we, we, we write and we can execute these queries as JSON objects. And we've got this diff we've got this concept here of filters and of queries. So here we're doing a match filter on a postcode and that field's been pre-configured to be able to work with that. Um, we can do some sorting uh, to make sure that our list is ordered in a good way, which is surprisingly difficult. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, this is a bit what the, uh, the the mapping looks like to get that set up. So pretty straightforward. Something a little bit more geo now. Um, here we're doing some reverse geocoding, so we support this as well. We can drag the pointer around the map and return a uh, match or a list of matches very, very quickly. And for that, again, we're using Elasticsearch. And here we're providing what we call a geodistance filter. So that will basically say, give me everything within 50 meters of this location. And we do a geodistance sort. So once we find everything, sort it with the closest first. Um, and here we, we can actually elect to just return the first entry or return a pick list of entries. So this is great. And again, you see a lot of people using Elasticsearch for geocoding scenarios. I believe Esri use it in their, in, in their geocoding service and potentially precisely Pitney Bowes. I think they may also use it. Um, the uh, MapZen project that was around a few years, which unfortunately the MapZen are no longer with us, but some of the technology that they created, their geocoding service, uh, Pelius is available still and it's still maintained. Uh, you can download it and it's an Elasticsearch back geocoder as well. Really good, really good library. Um, but exposure management, that was the object of the talk. What is exposure management? What is it? And really, you know, is Elasticsearch a good fit uh, for that use case? So this is quite a wordy definition of exposure management from Lloyds of London. Um, but really, it's the process of recording and monitoring where all your physical assets are, if you're an insurance company, so that you can effectively manage those. And within that, make sure that you're really not writing too many locations in one place. Um, so uh, as an insurer, this is super important. You want to avoid concentrations, particularly uh, where those uh, locations are susceptible to natural uh, disasters and natural events that can actually cause you a significant loss. So good examples there would be floods, earthquakes and storms, volcanic eruptions potentially. These are all areas where you can imagine you could know if you knew ahead of time um, where those particular regions were or you balance your portfolio, you'd make sure that if you did suffer a loss in one of that due to one of those events, that that loss is not so significant that it bring down your business. And again, knowing about that in advance or knowing about that before the event happens or recognizing, actually, I do have a huge amount of locations around the San Andreas Fault you might want to then go and purchase reinsurance, so which is insurance for insurers, just to cover yourself in the, in the event that that is a loss. And then also from time to time, you get completely unexpected events. Um, now, this obviously being, uh, you know, we just we've just had the uh, the twentieth anniversary of of nine eleven. For the insurance company I used to work for, this actually prompted them to seriously invest in geographic and geospatial technology to manage the loss. So the company that I worked for was a big multinational insurer. They had a whole uh, network of sub businesses and divisions, none of which uh, the speak the systems wouldn't talk to each other. Uh, they were all insuring. They were insuring in both the towers and a lot of the retail around the towers. And they only found out about that after the event had happened, and they started counting the losses uh, in terms of uh, dollar losses in terms of uh, of of, uh, of the insurance risk. Uh, I mean, the payouts were absolutely huge. Luckily, through sheer good luck, they managed to avoid a, a an event that caused the whole business to fail. This is a 300-year-old insurance company, but it came pretty close. Um, so after this event, they decided, actually, what we need to do is when we go on cover in our different businesses around the world, we need to bring all of that information into one geographic database so we can take action. That action might be actually to reduce our exposure by declining or, or when we come to renew some of these policies, actually saying, sorry, guys, we, we just can't do it anymore or by purchasing reinsurance. But the idea being to prevent a effectively a, 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 
organization extinction event. So stopping the company going under. Um, now, there are some tools, that, some really sophisticated tools out there that, that do this really well. And we don't claim to be one of those. Um, but what we do want to provide and equip our customers with is what we call a basic early warning system, something where before they go on cover, uh, which is always easy to avoid this by avoiding the risk in the first place, before they go on cover saying, actually, we have too much in that place. Uh, let's not take on this risk. So this is the way we do it at the moment. This is quite a simple approach. So this is, uh, and some of our competitors would do something similar. So all we're doing here is when the customer goes on cover, um, they have a mechanism of, uh, of sending us in all of the locations that they insure. And when they go on cover, we can provide a radial assessment. So within a 200 meter radius there, what is the potential exposure? That's useful. Uh, it's a useful tool, but Actually, the problem with that approach is that um, uh, geographic events and geographic disasters don't uh, follow. You know, they don't follow predefined radii. It's very unlikely. Maybe with a terrorism scenario, if there's a, a kind of a blast radius, that might work. But for, for things like floods or for fires, uh, that kind of approach is not terribly useful. Um, so we're going to improve it. And that's what we're working on at the moment. Um, the service is backed by Elasticsearch, and it's it's fantastic. It's great. Um, but where we think we can improve here, so if we took that same, that's the same map that I showed just now, same example. Now, at the moment, use the radial approach, we'd actually say, well, these properties here are all potentially uh, uh, an accumulation risk. But actually, if we were looking specifically at flood, they wouldn't be. So flood, the picture is quite different. So from a flood perspective, actually, we would just group those that are within uh, proximity to the river or within a catchment. So this is showing a, a, a flood model from one of our partners. And we might choose to buffer that out and provide and say, actually, these guys here are an accumulation risk. But this particular property is fine from a flood perspective. It's far enough from away from the river for that to be very unlikely to be captured by a, an event such as a, such as a flood. And again, um, from a fire perspective, actually, um, what we've done what we've done here is we've taken all the building outlines in the UK from the Ordnance Survey's open map local data set. We've buffered those and we've simulated the spread of a fire to a, to three meters either side and then intersected and dissolved those polygons. So actually here, what we could say was uh, down here, even though one of these locations from a radius might be further away, there's a good chance that if a fire starts in this block, it could spread and actually take out this whole block here. So again, this is a much better way of, uh, of, of managing accumulations and managing exposure. Um, so these are examples of known polygons. We can build our flood catchments in advance. We can build our fire blocks in advance, but we also wanna look at concentrations of risk that might not follow a predefined area. So these are dynamic rather than predefined. Now, again, We've seen a pro, uh, some companies uh, take the approach of using postal codes in the UK. Our postal codes are very granular. Uh, we've seen people do this with census blocks in the US. But the problem with this is postal codes have been set up to deliver mail, census blocks for capturing censuses. They're not a great way of, uh, of showing results. So what we think is some kind of gridded system that we need to use to be able to give a consistent view of risk. Um, so we looked at three different options. We looked at H3 um, from Uber with GeoHash and uh, S2 from Google. And we eventually actually settled on H3. So H3, if you haven't come across it, it's from Uber, fantastic library. And again, there's a great podcast on mapscaping uh, from the creator of H3. Um, it gives a set of libraries. It gives, it's a hexagonal view of the world. It's hierarchical. So you have, provides complete coverage of the globe at different zoom thresholds. And you know that if you're down at this hexagon here, actually, you can traverse the whole hierarchy of all of the parents and then the children as well. It's a really, really great bit of tech. That What we're going to be doing and what we are doing is we're taking, so for the predefined boundaries, we have those polygons. We know where they are. So as we are bringing the data in from our clients, we can pre-tag uh, all of those uh, locations using point in polygon queries. And then we can use the H3 library. It's a C library. There is a great post GIS plugin as well. 
uh, and, uh, and, 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 and Node and, and bindings for the popular languages. We can pre-cache and pre-code the, uh, uh, the lats and longs to these H3 ID, which allows us to do some really great visualizations. Um, and then on top of that, we can then use Elasticsearch to aggregate all of that risk and combine this by, by slicing and dicing policies with full text search and all of the great stuff that, uh, that, that H3 does, uh, so the Elasticsearch does out of the box. So this is very, very uh, simple visualization. You can see at the top here, I'm applying a filter. I'm looking at different levels of flood risk. This is all happening over, you can see over 85,000 policies. Um, down the bottom here, you can see as I'm going in, this is updated in real time. So all of this is running directly off Elasticsearch of a cluster, um, being visualized on the application with absolutely no latency, uh, just running in pseudo real time. It's super, super, super fast. Um, we're using Mapbox uh, and we're using DeckGL there for the visualization of the hexagons. So this is very simple. This is just a POC. Uh, and we think this technology will scale not just for tens or hundreds of thousands, but to millions, tens of millions, maybe even hundred millions of locations. Elasticsearch is primarily used as a log uh, analytics uh, repository by a lot of clients. And so it's, it's built to scale for this kind of data. So it's a simple example, and we're planning to build this into a full application uh, that we're going to roll out in 2022. So really, I guess to summarize, if there's a takeaway from this is, is yeah, think about Elasticsearch when you're looking for a tool. Um, when you're looking, if you're doing a lot of aggregation, you want it to be very quick. You want it to cope with huge amounts of data. And very importantly as well is schema flexibility. Uh, Elasticsearch will allow, uh, it's a document store. It uses something called an inverted index. So you can actually add fields into it on the flight and it will just index them. It's a really great piece of kit and great for this kind of use case. That's everything for me. I think I'm out of time. Um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, again, uh, a bit of a plea for any of you out there like myself who've built a business on geospatial technology that you've discovered at phosphor -G. Uh, phosphor -G is a great cause. OSGO is a great cause. Um, put your hand up, do a talk at phosphor -G. Uh, We now sponsor OSGO. We've sponsored phosphor -G UK. And, uh, in Edinburgh in 2020, uh, 2019, sorry. So, uh, you know, we, we, we're really pleased to be able to give back and we'd encourage others to do the same. Uh, and thank you all for your time. Mark, that was excellent. Uh, let's see, do we have any questions? Uh, okay, we've got one question. Uh, great and very nice presentation. Any plans or options to replicate this in other countries, uh, considering the country data limitations? Uh, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. And yes, absolutely. We're designing this. To, so at the moment, our uh, our geocoding is UK and Ireland. We do provide. We have some customers who work with us in uh, in the US. Um, so we do provide uh, for an insure out of London. We provide them with wildfire. Uh, uh, services in the US and the platform is designed to be globally scalable. So my kind of view next year, so the clients that we work with are UK domicile, but they do have international exposure and we want this to be able to work globally. Um, so that is the plan for next year. Cool. Well, awesome. I think that was the only question we had. That was a very good presentation. Um, and with that, I guess we have wrapped up the morning session. So uh, took it out on a high note. Excellent. <laughs> awesome. Thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for attending. And we look forward to seeing you all in, I think we're in Florence next year, is it? I don't know. I believe uh, so. I don't oh, know if it's, wait a minute. It's, we got another question. Do the insurance okay. companies... One, one more before we go. Do the insurance companies you work with have concerns about the slivers gaps inherent to H3 as hexagons do not nest neatly, and how do you address those concerns? Well, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's fine. I think I'd kind of, I hadn't explicitly spelled it out, but um, in terms of, yeah, there are no limitations. Absolutely. It's not a problem. For the scale that we work with, it's really not an issue. I think um, for some more pure uh, geo uh, uh, use cases, it would be a problem. But 
you know, Uber have created it for aggregating up uh, Uber journeys. Um, we're going to be aggregating up uh, insurance risk, and it's really not a problem for us or for our customers. Cool. Um, but it's great. Yeah, it's well observed. And and again, you know, not all, all these things come with a health warning. You always need to make sure these things are the right for your use case. For our use case, it's fine. For others, it may not be. Excellent. OK, so I think that got all the questions. <laughs> so, great. yeah, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. That was OK, excellent. great. Well, I hope, hope to see everyone in Florence next year. And I'm looking forward. I can drive there in five hours. So I'm definitely <laughs> going to be going for that one. Yes. Awesome. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Randall. Okay. And I guess that is it. And uh, thank you for attending the morning session. So I will now attempt to put up a banner that I have done so well in the past and doing. Uh,